I'm going to start a series tonight, and that's the reason that I told David I'm going to. We were just going to put out the five nights as one package, one teaching, but uh, I'm going to need the four mornings that I teach to make this all uh, to cover all the material that I need to. And I'm going to start talking on the love of God. Actually, from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the scripture says there it was talking about faith and about the gifts of the Spirit and all of these things. And 1 Corinthians 13 says, Now abides faith, hope, and charity, which charity is the old English word for God's kind of love. These three, but the greatest of these is charity, or God's kind of love. You know, recently I taught a whole series in Winston-Salem on the love of God, but I was talking about the love from God towards us. And uh, I approached that from a totally unique perspective than I've ever done before. Basically, this week is going to be primarily talking about how we are supposed to walk in love towards other people and how beneficial this is. And I know that there may be some people that came here, I've, I've talked to a couple already, who came here to be healed. And you're saying, oh man, I was hoping that you were going to preach on faith or do something that would really help me to receive. Well, the Bible says, Galatians 5, 6, faith works by love. When it was contrasting or comparing faith, hope, and love, it says that love is the greatest of all of these things. And what I want to do tonight is I just want to take some scriptures and begin to point out how important walking in love, not only receiving the love of God, but walking in love towards our brothers and sisters, how essential it is in your life. And the logic behind this is that if you don't understand how absolutely essential to you loving God and loving your fellow man, if you don't understand that and participate in it, well then I can guarantee you, you aren't going to receive the benefits that go along with this. Or here's another way of saying it, as long as you can live without walking in love towards other people more than you will. This has to become a priority. We have to recognize how important this is. And so this is the main point I want to get across tonight. And our society, again, we are a generation that is probably more influenced by our secular world than any generation of Christians that ever have lived because of television and because of the media. We see things happen in real time on the opposite side of the world. We know all of the trash that's going on. And so because of this, we really are inundated with this. And there's a lot of subtle things associated with this that I don't think many of us are recognizing. But our shows that we watch, our uh, comedies, the movies that we watch, everything is coming at stuff from such an ungodly, anti-Christian perspective. And I believe that many of us have been numb to it and just don't really realize how far off base we are. And many of us are praying for healing, for deliverance, uh, prosperity. We're wanting joy. We're wanting peace in our life. But I tell you, all of these things really are wrapped up in us, first of all, receiving the love of God and walking in love towards other people. If you aren't walking in love towards other people, I guarantee you, you are just giving Satan a huge, huge inroad into your life. So I say all of these things to say that regardless of what your need is, God's love is the antidote to whatever your problem is. And if you don't think that, well then that's just an indication that you haven't really understood and seen how powerful and uh, how important walking in love among your brothers and sisters is. So let's turn over to Matthew chapter 22 and look at a passage of scripture here. This is where Jesus was being um, grilled, criticized by the scribes and the Pharisees and some lawyers. And these people came to Jesus. And it says in Matthew chapter 22, and I believe it's uh, verse 35, it says that one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, so this wasn't a sincere question at all. He said, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Now, many of us have seen this before, but for a moment, just forget that you've read this in the Bible. And if you hadn't have read this passage of Scripture, if somebody just comes up to you and says, what's the greatest commandment that was ever given? You know, most of us would have had a totally different answer than what Jesus gave. Jesus just 
turn this lawyer... I mean, he was a guy who had studied the Scripture and made his livelihood. He was supposed to be an expert about the Old Testament law and about all these kind of things. This isn't talking about a civil lawyer. This was a a religious lawyer, a person who debated the law and how you had to obey it. And he came uh, wanting to trip up Jesus. And Jesus gave him an answer that just totally shocked him. He said unto him in verse 37, he says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all of the law and the prophets. Did you know that these weren't even part of the Ten Commandments? You can read this over in Deuteronomy chapter 6. It quotes it there. And this, this was expressed in a number of different ways in the Old Testament. But you know, people today are talking about the law and you've got to keep all of these things and they're always talking about the Ten Commandments. Basically, the Ten Commandments are just an outgrowth of this. Did you know that if you loved God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, if you loved other people, you would never have to tell a person anything else. That would automatically fulfill all of the law. If you loved God first and foremost, you'd never go after any other gods, which was one of the Ten Commandments. You would honor Him and you would honor His commands towards you. You would never hurt anybody else if you loved other people more than you love yourself. Did you know if you've ever had a problem with lying, you can sit there and say, man, I just exaggerate and I don't know why I overstate things and why I'm, I just have a hard time just saying it like it really is. And you can sit there and... and You know, explain it away in a thousand different ways, but the bottom line is you love yourself more than you love other people. If you loved other people, you would never manipulate and try and influence a person unjustly by giving them incorrect information or exaggerating or something. You'd be absolutely brutally honest with people. You know, when a person comes up and says... So, do you like this dress or do you like my hairdo? You know, most people will not tell the truth. (laughs) Now, there's a right and a wrong way to do this. I'm not just saying that you say, you know, you are the ugliest thing I think I've ever seen. You can be tactful, but you know what? You could say something that doesn't uh, lie about it. But the truth is, most of us are so concerned about ourselves, and we're so concerned what somebody says that you just sit there and lie and say, oh, it's beautiful, I love it. When the truth is, you hate it. You know what? You don't have to be mean, but you should be truthful and honest. You can always find some positive spin to put on things. But the truth is, see, we we love ourselves. We think about ourselves. If you loved other people, you'd tell people the truth. I tell you, you aren't doing people a service when you lie to them. I remember Bob and Joy Nichols, of course... um, Wendell and Linda work for them. Many of you may know Bob and Joy Nichols, but their daughter Janet came up here one time and she had just had her hair dyed purple, green, pink, and I don't know, seven or eight different colors, and it probably stood up six inches on the top of her head. And and she said something about, what do you think about my hair? And, you know, I didn't rag on her, and I said, well, uh, I, you know, I didn't know exactly what, I forgot what I said now, but... But I didn't say anything bad, and I made a joke out of it, and I hugged her, and I laughed at her. But basically, I said, boy, that is the weirdest looking hair I've ever seen. And, and anyway, Bob and Joy came up to me later and says, thank you, thank you, thank you for telling her the truth. says, we've introduced her to all of our friends up here, and people don't want to offend her. And so they just say, oh, I love it. I think it's great. And says, we've been fighting with her all the way up here, trying to get her to say that it's wrong. And she's saying, but all of your friends love it. And you know what? It posed a problem. You need to tell people the truth. There's a right and wrong way to do it. But anyway, Jesus said that if you loved other people, it would be the fulfilling of the law. If you loved other people, you'd never steal anything from another person. You know, a person who is a thief is a person that loves themselves and thinks about themselves more than they think about somebody else. A person who would commit adultery. I guarantee you, you aren't thinking about the other person. You aren't thinking about your wife. You aren't thinking about the person you commit adultery with. A person would never go into a prostitute if they loved that other person more than they love themselves. Just think of the damage that you're doing to somebody and how that you are just helping them destroy their life. You know, if you loved other people, it would keep your pants zipped. Amen. (laughs) 
It would keep you living right. It would keep you doing the right thing. It would keep you walking right if you loved other people. But the bottom line is we don't live in a society that loves other people. Everything is all about self. It's about satisfying yourself, about meeting your needs. And I tell you, if we really understood the love of God, it would stop so many things in your life. You know, some of you may be struggling with some habits like smoking or drinking. Well, the way that the church basically has approached that is, if you don't stop this, God's going to punish you. He won't answer your prayers. You're unholy. And so they put this condemnation on you and things like that. Here's another way to approach it. You know what? Even if you don't care about yourself and whether it's killing you, don't you care about your family, about your kids, about your grandkids? Don't you want to be around for them? Is this what you want for them? If you were to think about other people more than you think about yourself, I guarantee you it would help you break habits. It would cause you to start doing things differently. And if we had the, you know, we could spend the rest of the week talking about this, but this would solve basically every problem you had if you loved God more than yourself and if you loved other people more than you love yourself. That would solve all of your problems. That's what Jesus is saying. That's what Paul said when he said that now abides faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. It says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 6, it says, Faith works by love. If you don't have a love relationship with God, you're going to have trouble believing Him. But you know what? If you do understand how much God loves you, you just instantly respond. Faith is a result of love. Faith works by love. Love is what makes faith work. You know, children, you don't have to sit there and tell children, now you believe your parents and you make sure that you do this and you do that. You know, children just naturally tend to love and respect and and because of that they believe their parents. They They don't have to use faith on them to make things happen. You know, kids don't sit there and say, I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that my dad's going to feed me tomorrow and I believe that I'm going to be able to get my clothes and I believe I'm going to get a track when I'm three years old and I believe I'm going to get a bicycle. And they don't sit here and use confession and manipulation to try and get their father to do something because they just love him and they just trust. You know, if you really love a person, trust is just a natural result of that. If you're one of these that is trying to sit here and confess the word 500 times that by his stripes you are healed and you're fighting, to make it come to pass, you can say what you want to, but you don't know how much God loves you. If you knew how much God loved you, I guarantee you, you don't have to do anything to manipulate God and to get God to do something. So much of our religious activity is really because we don't know and we don't understand the love that God has for us. Here's another passage of Scripture over in James chapter 2. And uh, James was preaching to these people and talking about how they were treating the poor, how they were giving preference to the rich people. And he was uh, rebuking them for the way that they had been treating the poor in their services. But in James chapter 2, in in verse 8, it says, If you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, you do well. And he goes on, to say something else. But he called this the royal law. And you know, I got to meditating on this. Why is this called a royal law? And I read this in commentaries and nobody addressed it. And I don't honestly know. But you know, as I thought about it, I just believe that what this is saying is that when you say something is a royal edict or something, that means that it's of the highest authority. In other words, this is... This is the highest of all of the laws, which is basically the same point that Jesus was making over there in Matthew chapter 22. The greatest commandment, the greatest thing that any of us can do is to love God and to love people. I mean, that's the highest law. It's the number one thing that God has given us to do. And brothers and sisters, I believe you all are great. I believe that all of you that took a week out to come to this conference, I believe that your fanatics are either a fanatic drug you here, but you are real close to being a fanatic. I'm not ragging on you, but I bet you that the majority of us in here have some serious problems walking in love towards others. And it's not been that high of a priority in our life. And you know, until it becomes, until you get to where you make this the royal law, the number one law, the law that fulfills everything else, until this becomes a focus of your life to love God and to love other people. 
Until you focus on that, you aren't going to have the benefits of love working in your life. And it's just that simple. We need to recognize that this is paramount. And if you aren't walking in love, then it doesn't matter how holy you're living. It doesn't matter how much you go to church and how much you pay your tithes, how much you do anything else. If you aren't walking in love, you are giving Satan a tremendous inroad into your life. And you don't have to look any further than this issue to see where, why things aren't working in your life. God is love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. It doesn't just say that God has love. It says that God is love. And if God is love, then Amos chapter 3 verse 3 says, How can two walk together except they be agreed? If God is love and if you aren't love, how can you sit here and say that, Oh man, I have this great relationship with God and I'm trusting God and yet you aren't, <laughs> you aren't, doing, you aren't walking in love. The Bible says you can't walk together unless you're agreed. You got to start walking in love. God is love, and for you to have God flow through you, you need to start walking in love. It's just really that simple. It's not real, real complicated. Amen. So we need to recognize exactly how important love is. It says over in John three sixteen, of course, that uh, God so loved the world. If God loved other people, then you know what? We have got to love other people to walk with God. And, you know, uh, we were talking just recently. I can't remember if this was Renan. I forgot. But anyway, Jamie was telling me about some kid that was uh, saying something about, you know, uh, how does God love all of these people? And they were asking some question about that. But, you know, the Bible says that God loves the whole world. God loves the people that you don't love. God loves the very people that you're so angry at and that you're bitter at. And if you are harboring a grudge, if you are speaking evil of them, if you're doing something like that, did you know that you're going exactly contrary to everything that God is? Now, that doesn't mean that God approves of every person. And that doesn't mean that God condones everything that they do. I'm not telling you that, you, you know, some, we're going to talk about this. I can't get everything out all in one night. But we're going to have to identify what is love and how you treat other people. We're going to be talking about forgiveness and how to walk in forgiveness before this week is over. And so I'm not saying that this means that you just approve of everything that a person does and that you lower your standards and you get this uh, sentimental, emotional feeling about everybody. I don't believe that's true. God hates sin. He doesn't hate the sinner, but God hates the actions of some people. But God loves these people. God so loved the world that He gave Himself for them. And you know, if you can honestly, if you can't honestly say that you love other people, even the people who have done you wrong, even the people who rub you the wrong way, then you know what? Again, this is a major indication of why things aren't working in your life. You can love other people. And praise God, I believe that by the end of this week, we're going to talk about this stuff in a way that I think it's going to help you to be able to walk in love in a way that you never have before. Over in 1 John chapter 4, let me show a couple of scriptures to you out of here. 1 John chapter 4, verse 12, it says, No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and His love is perfected in us. And then if you'll drop on down to verse 20, it says, if, if a man say, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? You know, that is a strong, strong passage of Scripture. And most of us want to interpret that some way or another and take away the bite of that Scripture. And you know, I just can't see any way around this. The Scripture says that if you say you love God, but if you hate your brother whom you have seen, how can you say that you love God whom you have not seen? And again, nobody told me about you. This isn't because somebody said, boy, you need to preach on this because they're going to be at this meeting. I know some of you are thinking, you know, that somebody set you up. I believe it was God. There are some of you here that have things against maybe a mate, a relative, a co-worker, 
somebody who's done you wrong, an ex-husband, an ex-wife or something, and you really do have some bitterness and hate, and yet you're trying to go on in your relationship with God and just thinking everything is fine. You can't understand why things aren't working better, and yet you have unresolved relationships with people over here, and you are just somehow or another trying to divorce yourself from that and make it like, well, I'm going on with God regardless of this. It doesn't work that way. You can't truly walk with God and walk in love with God if you aren't walking in love with other people. Now that needs some explanation and later this week I'm going to get into that because that doesn't mean that everybody loves you. Jesus had people hate Him. And there was lots of people mad at Jesus, but He wasn't mad at them. He turned around to the very people who crucified Him and said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. You know, I've got people that literally hate me and have done a lot of negative things against me. But I can truthfully say tonight that regardless of what anybody's done, I am not mad at anybody. I don't hate anybody. I am not out to get anybody. I'm not carrying a chip on my shoulder towards anybody. Now, there are some people that I'm aware that they are being used and motivated by the devil. And you know what? I wouldn't give them uh, a great amount of recognition. I had somebody recently want to preach in our school. And they, they uh, didn't say it, but they were implying, won't, why won't you let me back in school? And you know what? These people hate me. <laughs> and I just, I didn't say it, but I thought to myself, I said, why would I let you into this school so that you could dump on me and trash me in front of the very people that I'm trying to minister to? You know what? I'm not against them. I don't have any ill will. I've blessed them and sent people their way and done things. But, you know, I'm not going to just give somebody, supply the knife so they can stab me in the back. <laughs> I'm not saying that you're just supposed to sit here and have these warm fuzzies for every person, but I can say that I am not mad at any person. I walk in love towards people. And if you can't say that, I'm telling you, that's one big reason that things aren't working in your life. Here's another passage of Scripture. Look over in James chapter 3. This is really important that you get this. You know, if you don't hear anything else I say tonight, you ought to get this. This is major right here. James chapter 3 and verse 16. It says, For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Now we're talking about love, God's kind of love, but envying and strife are the opposites of God's kind of love. God's kind of love would exclude this. If you really love that other person, you'd never be envious of them. You know, jealousy is just desiring what somebody else has. But envy, if you look it up in the dictionary, is not just being jealous, but it's jealousy with malice, with intent to hurt, to bring that other person down. You're bitter and angry at them is what the word uh, envy is talking about. And strife is where you are angry at a person and and you're either venting it some way, whether it's internal or external. And it says where those two things are, there is confusion. The Bible says over in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 that God is not the author of confusion but of peace as in all of the churches of the Lord. And so if God isn't the author of confusion, that means Satan is. So you could say that where envy and strife is, there is confusion or Satan and every evil work. Not some evil works, every evil work. I think that this is important to make this point because again, we all come from different backgrounds. And you know, some of us have been raised to where there was just so much strife. There was so much, um, I don't know, hatred. It's become normal. And again, our society, this has become the norm. Most people live in strife. And if they don't have it in their own, own home, then they'll turn it on television and watch other people fight and get mad at each other and do things for entertainment. Just blows my mind. I do not enjoy strife and hatred and stuff like that. But most of us sit there and use it for entertainment. So we've actually deadened ourselves and we've lost our perspective on what God intended things to be. You know, I had a guy in one of my churches, this was in... Um, Childress, Texas, and we led this guy to the Lord. It's a very long story, but he and his wife got born again and came into our church. And, um, I mean, they were gloriously saved. It's miraculous. I could give you a long testimony about how they got saved. But after they came into the church, they were only there for, I think, four or five months. And then this guy came to me, and he he just uh, wanted to let me know he was leaving the church. 
And I said, why are you leaving the church? And he says, because it's full of strife. He says, there's just everybody in this church is angry. There's just strife. He says, we're going to go back out and live in the desert. (laughs) And I told him, I said, do you know what? I'll have to admit, there is a lot of strife in this church. But you know why it's here? It's because of you. (laughs) I said, there wasn't any strife that I was aware of in this church until you came in it. And I could give you a whole list of things that he did, but he just (laughs) criticized every person, everything. He was one of the most critical people I'd ever seen in my life. And he, every person in that church had gotten to where they hated to see him coming. They'd lock the doors when he started coming over because he just, I mean, he was one of these naturalists. And if you peeled your potatoes, you were cutting out the most beneficial part of it. And he'd get over and rag on you and gripe until you quit peeling your potatoes. You needed to eat the skin. If you used deodorant, you weren't natural. And boy, he needed to be a little unnatural. And he just griped about anything and everything. He found something to criticize every single person over. So anyway, I just told this guy, I said, yeah, there's strife in this church and you're the root of it. I said, Satan has been using you. Every person in this church has gotten angry since you came into this church. And I didn't know what his response was going to be. I honestly didn't. But you know what? He just looked at me and then he started crying. And he says, you know, if you were to tell me to act well when I'm feeling sick, I could do that because I felt well before. If you were to ask me to start acting prosperous when I don't have any money, I could do that because I've been prosperous before. But he says, you're telling me that I'm supposed to love. And he says, I don't think I've ever loved or been loved in my life. And he began to give me a story. He was the first person in the history of California indicted by the grand jury of California three times before he was 13 years old. He had lived in reformatory since he was five years old. And he had never known love. He had never known any of these things. And when he was saying all of this to me, it's like a light bulb went on in my You know, I was expecting him to walk in love and to get along with people. And this guy had never gotten along with anybody in his life. Hatred and strife and fight was normal to him. And I found out that his idea of what was normal was totally different than everybody else. And since that time, I've come to realize that, you know, there's, there's people right here in this auditorium that you have grown up and maybe you came to the Lord recently And you now know that God loves you and you're trying to love other people. But our standards are so diverse. Many of you grew up in in the home that just yell. That's the way that things were. You know, in my home, we had a good home. And I'm not saying it was bad, but we did have a double standard. Because I remember one time... Uh, being at a movie theater and and I went for just one show and when I got there they had a matinee on and so my dad came to pick me up and in front of my friends I said, oh dad, please can I stay for this second show? And he said, no, you need to go home and I made a scene out of it and he let me stay. But when I got home, he liked to beat me to death. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and he said, you know what? He says, I wasn't going to say anything in front of people. I didn't want them to think anything bad. But he says, you never do that again. And I learned that, you know what? When you were in front of people, you behaved yourself differently than when you were at home. When you were at home, you could kind of throw a fit and get away with it. But in public, boy, you better do things right. And, and there's a double standard. It actually ought to be the exact opposite. You shouldn't have a double standard. You ought to be the same all the time. But you know, my brother, he really blessed me right after he first got married. Uh, you know, they'd been married about a month or something like this, and they had some family, I mean, some friends coming over to eat. And so his wife, Virginia, started getting out the china and the crystal and all of the sterling silver and setting the table. And he said, What are you doing? And she says, Oh, we got company coming over. I'm putting all of the good stuff out. And my brother, he got all of that stuff and put it up. And he says, from now on, he says, we'll, we'll eat on this stuff when the company comes. And when my family is here, we're eating on the china and using the crystal and the sterling silver. And he treated his family better than he treated other people. It really, if you're going to have a double standard, it ought to go that direction. But I'm saying that many of us have grown up in homes where there's fighting and there's strife. This verse says that where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Not some, every evil work. You know, there are people who are trying to walk in healing. And yet you just, I mean, you yell at your kids. And don't even see the connection. 
about why your healing isn't working. And you don't even think anything about, well, that's just the way you talk to your kids. Get up and make your bed right now. Don't come down until you get this done. Well, if I was visiting with you, and if I was staying in your room, and if I came down, and if I hadn't made my bed, and if you were to yell at me, you get up there and make that bed right now. And you say that to me, and then wonder why we aren't getting along, and why we aren't having a better relationship. You know, many of you talk to your kids in ways that you would never talk to a stranger. I've done a lot of marriage counseling and I've had people come in for marriage counseling. And I remember this one instance in particular where, you know, they were each telling their side of the story. And after listening to it for a while, I just looked at the man and I said, you are a first class jerk. (laughs) And I said, you need to change. And this guy, you could tell he bristled, but then he kind of settled down and he says, you know, you're probably right. And he started being nice and kind. And I said, now that right there is the major problem. I said, you just allowed a stranger. It's the first time I'd ever met this couple. You allowed me to call you a jerk. And you didn't scream or yell or respond. I said, what would have happened if your wife would have just said you are a first class jerk? I said, it would have been World War III. Here you are treating me, a stranger, kinder than you treat your wife. And you wonder why things aren't going along. I said, man, something is seriously wrong with this. And yet, brothers and sisters, there's a lot of people sitting right here that, you know, we're getting personal now. We're prying into your private life. But there are some of you that would talk to your mate in a way that you'd never treat me that rude. You treat your kids ruder than you would ever treat me. There's some of you, you know, you yell at your dog and think, well, it's a dog. It doesn't matter about who it is or what it is. I even had a guy in one of my churches that uh, I went over to his house and knocked on the door and nobody answered, but I could he- tell somebody was home, so I walked around back. This guy used to restore old cars, do uh, body work on them. And he had a two-before. Well, as a matter of fact, that was the same guy I was talking about who said that he was indicted by the grand jury three <laughs> times. For his... And he had a two-before, and he was beating his car and cursing it and I mean saying profanities that I'd never heard in my life and he was blaspheming this car and saying terrible things to it and when he saw me because I was the pastor of the church he stopped and kind of settled down and he said buddy it's just a car he says it doesn't matter what I say to a car and I said you know what it's not the car that's getting damaged by what you're doing you spewing out that stuff it says we're envying And strife is, there's confusion and every evil work. You just throw the door wide open to the devil every time you get into strife and anger. And it doesn't matter if it's at your dog. It doesn't matter if it's at your car. It doesn't matter if it's at some person that you'll never see. He just pulled in front of you in traffic. And you wave at him with one finger or, you know, whatever. You know, it doesn't matter whether they know about it or not. If you get into strife, you just flung a door open to the devil to come into your life. And if you do that, he'll eat your lunch and pop the bag. Amen. So you don't want that. You know, I went to a church one time and there was a... This was a church that had not believed that healing was for every person all of the time. They believed God could heal, but it was just up to God. It was the sovereignty of God and things like this. And this church had just gotten turned on to the Lord. They'd been listening to my teaching. And they started believing that God wanted us well all of the time. And so they'd started preaching that. And for about six months they'd been preaching that. Well, just two days before I got to this church, a boy in the church who was about 15 years old died... The church had been fasting for him for a solid week. He was in the hospital on life support and they'd been fasting for him a solid week and he died and they had the funeral two days before I got there. And they were brand new in all of this and I was the one that kind of encouraged them to believe it was God's will to heal and a lot of them were just saying, well, it is not God's will because we did everything we knew and this boy died anyway and their faith was really shaken and so the pastor wanted me to minister on that and so that's what I spent the whole week preaching on and I went out with his parents every day for lunch because his parents were just devastated and anyway it's a long story but over two or three days here's what really happened this boy was over at a friend's house and they were playing with a gun thought it wasn't loaded 
and he put it up to his head and pulled the trigger and blew his brains out. And that's the reason he had been in the hospital. Then everybody started praying and believing for him to be healed. But the rest of the story was that the reason this happened is because the father and mother were going through a divorce. And there had been so much strife in the home. They had been screaming and yelling at each other. And, of course, it had affected the kids. And that very morning that this tragedy happened, the boy and the mother had had an argument, and she yelled at him, and she says, Get out of my sight! I never want to see you again. And the boy was so hurt, he went to school, he broke the school rules, went over to a friend's house, and they were goofing around. And that, I believe that's how Satan had this inroad, where envy and strife is, there's confusion in every evil work. And yet, when this happened, of course, everybody went to believing, and they just didn't even realize that they had been living in strife for years, had spoken terrible things, and this just gave Satan such an inroad into their life that I guarantee you, you aren't going to sit there for years just throwing open the door saying, Satan, shoot your best shot, destroy my life, and then turn around and with one week of fasting and prayer undo years and years and years worth of strife. Thank you for that thunderous silence. And you know what? I finally had to tell the parents. I said, you know what? I'm not here to condemn you, but you opened up a door so wide that Satan just came in and beat you. And I said, you know, you can't give Satan inroads like that into your life. And yet many of us, again, have been raised with levels of strife and things in our life. And we think that this is normal to be angry. We think it's just normal to sit here and talk about politicians and trash them. You know, again, some of these talk show hosts, these conservative talk show hosts, I'll listen to them some because I think that they're doing a service countering our biased media today. And so I think that there is a place for it. But you know what? I have to take that stuff in small doses because even though they're saying some of the truth, their sarcasm, the terrible things that they say, it's strife. It's ungodly. That is not the way that Jesus would expose something wrong and stuff. And he wouldn't use the sarcasm and the thing. And many of us are plugged into that three hours a day listening to that. And you know what? It's giving Satan a direct inroad into your life. It doesn't matter if they're politicians. You still can't sit there and speak evil of people without Satan having an inroad into your life. And so we just trash things. And because the person may not know what we've said, we think that it doesn't matter what we say. It doesn't matter whether the person you're talking about hears it or not or whether you ever affect them. Every time you get into strife, every time you get out of love, God is love, there isn't like, you know, multitude of different forces out there. It's just God and the devil. And if you aren't flowing in God's love, if you aren't walking in love with other people and being kind, then I don't care what shade of it you are in. To some degree or another, you're over here allowing Satan inroad into your life. That's like trying to run a race, and yet you got all of these weights on you. You may still be moving. You might be headed towards the finish line, but I guarantee you, you aren't going to win the race weighted down with all of these things. The Scripture says we've got to lay aside the weights and the sin which does so easily beset us in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. And I'm telling you that a lack of love, strife, the criticism, the gossip, all of the things that go on in our life, many of us haven't connected these dots and hadn't seen it, and we just can't understand why we aren't seeing better results. And yet over here we are just giving Satan huge inroad into our life through strife. And so this verse says John 3, I mean James 3:16 where envying and strife is there is confusion and every evil work. Not just a few, not some, it's everything. It's just like you're saying Satan shoot your best shot. You can't afford strife. And I know some of you are thinking but you don't know what this person has done to me. We're going to talk about this later in the week. I'm going to be talking about forgiveness and how you operate in forgiveness and how you, how you make these things work. But I'm, first of all, if you don't understand how important this is, if you just think, well, I was raised and we always lived in strife and that's just the way that it is. I'm just an A-type personality or you have all of these different type of reasons and excuses for being the way you are. I tell you, when you got born again, you became a new creature And in your spirit, your spirit is as loving and as kind and as merciful as Jesus is. 
And if I don't care what you were raised at, I don't care what your family does, I don't care what your family history is, you are now a born-again person and you have the ability to walk in love. The Lord commanded us to walk in love. And so you need to quit identifying with just your physical blood family and start recognizing you've got new nature flowing in your veins. And if you are mean as a snake, I don't care if your whole family's that way, change. Amen? Start walking in love. And you've got to get to a place to where you realize that this isn't optional, that you have to do it. Also, look over here in John chapter 13. This is Jesus speaking the night before His crucifixion to His disciples. This is some of the very last instructions that He gave His um, disciples. And He said this in John chapter 13 and verse 34. He says, A new commandment. I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. Now this isn't talking about just love between us and God, not talking about just your personal relationship with God, but talking about how that this love needs to be manifest in our relationships with others. And it says this is how every person will know that we are truly His disciples. Did you know that the greatest witness that the church will ever have and the greatest witness that you can ever have is your personal love for other members of the body of Christ? And let me just suggest to you that this is one reason that the church isn't having a greater impact on our society today. Is because, man, we have every religious group fighting against other religious groups, trashing the other person. There are people that actually have ministries to where they feel it's their responsibility to get on radio and expose everybody. And they don't teach anything. If you were to take their ministry and take what they are for, nobody knows what they are for. They don't teach for anything. All they do is teach against this and expose this person and criticize, and I tell you what, that is a terrible witness to the world. You know, the first century church didn't have any of the benefits we've got. They didn't have radio and television, tapes and books. They didn't have any of this stuff. They didn't put uh, bumper stickers on the camels going across the desert. (laughs) They didn't have tracks. They didn't have printing, and yet in 30 years they turned the world upside down. And you know, one of the major reasons, according to what Jesus said, because they, they actually, when they met together, this wasn't what they called it. The unbelievers criticized it and called them love feast. When they came together for church, they called them love feast because these people loved each other so much. You know, we had a little 13-year-old girl over there tonight that was talking about, they, they used to come here uh, to school and then they moved back to Chicago. And she was talking about when I was in Chicago not long ago, and how that she just couldn't wait to come to the meetings. And when she walked in, she says, oh, it was just so wonderful to be with family. And they're moving back here in just a month or so. And she says, there's just something about this ministry. She says, I just love this ministry. I love the people. And here's a 13-year-old girl basically expressing love. I mean, talking like a lot of adults don't talk about how she loves the people of God, how she loves the people here. And you know what? That's the way that it ought to be. We ought to love one another. And this is how all men will know that we are His disciples. Let me, let me put it down to a personal level, that some of you may be praying and interceding for a mate or for a child or for some relative or something. And man, you preach at them every time you get a chance. You never miss an opportunity to put a dig in. You leave your Bible out open to a scripture that you hope that they read. You leave my tapes around on self-centeredness, the source of all grief, hoping that they'll read that one. And you know what? You spend time praying for them and you do all of these things and you're wanting to see all of these transformations. And yet, you're just as mean as you can possibly be. You gripe, you nag, You criticize, you never miss an opportunity to put them down in some way to make your point, to criticize, and then you just can't understand. God, why haven't you answered my prayers? How come nothing is changing? (laughs) Amen or oh me? 
I'm telling you, that's not the way that the kingdom works. This is really practical stuff. And I know that everybody wants, well, let's get to talking about faith or let's get to talking about this. But you know what? Really, this is why a lot of people are frustrated and they aren't seeing the prayers answered and people saved and people changed is because of you. You know, Mahatma Gandhi, I don't know how many of you have heard this story, but I actually was giving this. I forget where I was. I think I was in Norfolk, Virginia, and his grandson, the one that in the pictures, if, if any of you saw Mahatma Gandhi, this was a real famous picture, and his grandson called Mahatma Gandhi uh, Bat Boo, I think is what he called him. And anyway, this is the guy that was raised by Mahatma Gandhi, and he came to me and confirmed every word that I was saying and said every bit of that is absolutely true. But Mahatma Gandhi, when he was exiled from India, he was over in Africa, and during that period of time, he got to really searching who the true God was, and he got to study in different religions, and he read the New Testament to check out the claims of Christianity. And after reading the New Testament, he was absolutely convinced that Jesus was the Son of God and that He was the only way to God. And so he went to a church service, a Presbyterian church service in Africa, and his, he went there for the purpose of confessing Jesus as his Lord and being born again. And because he was black, they wouldn't let him into the church service. And he said, I would have been a Christian if I hadn't have meant one. And I can guarantee you that those Presbyterians were over there trying to reach people. And they wanted people to be saved. But they didn't operate in love towards people and that turned people off. There is probably no way that we'll ever know until we stand before God how many people have been turned away from Christianity because of the strife and the criticism and the fighting going on among groups. There's probably no way of telling how many people who were married to a Christian and would have been one if they hadn't have been married to one and saw them operate in strife and things like this. I'm telling you that there's some of you that are praying that your people at work will be born again and that things will change, and yet you are giving them a witness. You criticize, you talk about people, you gossip, you do things that are just totally destroying and undercutting your witness. You know, there's a song we used to sing in the Baptist church that says, What you are speaks so loud that the world can't hear what you say. They're looking at your walk. They're not listening to your talk. They're judging by your actions every day. And there's many of us praying that these things will change. You're wanting your neighbors to be saved, and yet they can hear you yelling at night. And you're thinking, what do they have that I want? I'm not saying any of these things to condemn, but I am saying it to put an emphasis on how important walking in love is. Jesus said that this is the key. This is what's going to make everybody know that you are my disciples, that you have love one for another. And I can guarantee you that this is an area that there's, there's a lot of Christians. I'm sure that there's people here this week. I'm sure God didn't put this on my heart for all the people who didn't come. I bet you that the people that are right here need to hear this. There are some of you that are wanting healing, prosperity, joy, peace. You're wanting God to open up a, a, a business, you open up a ministry to do something. You're believing for this, and yet walking in love is just, you know, it'd be nice if it happened, but it's not a priority. You know what? You need to put a priority on it. You need to recognize that this is the heart of everything. This is the greatest of all of the commandments. That if we aren't walking in love, we are opening up a door to every evil work. This is how all people are going to know that we are His disciples. The greatest thing that we can possibly do is walk in love. There's nothing more important than that. Faith is not more important than walking in love. Getting healed, delivered, and prospered isn't more important than walking in love. I bet you there's people sitting right here in this auditorium that you've achieved a level of prosperity and yet you aren't walking in love. And you know what? There's an emptiness and a sadness on the inside of you that you can pray for joy and peace all you want, but if you just start loving people and quit being angry and critical and doing some of the things that we do, you'd be amazed how much that would transform your emotions. This is not optional. It's something that we have to operate in. Look over in uh, Luke chapter 17 
at a passage. This is uh, Jesus' disciples talking to him. In Luke chapter 17, in verse 1, it says, Then said he unto his disciples, this is Jesus speaking to his disciples, says, It is impossible, but that offenses will come. But woe unto him through whom they come. It were better for him that a millstone were hung about his neck and he cast into the sea than he should offend one of these little ones. Man, again, we could get off of this subject and talk about this for quite a while, but this is a pretty strong statement. Jesus said it would be better to tie a huge weight around your neck and cast you into the sea and drown you than it would be for you to offend one of his little ones. Probably hadn't heard too many messages on that one. This isn't going to draw the big crowds, but it's true. This is not good when you offend other people and you go around sowing strife. You know, the Lord lists in two or three different places in the book of Proverbs seven things that he hated. And he would talk about murderers and liars and all of this kind of stuff. But the number one thing that he hated was him that sowed discord among the brethren. He hated all of them, but he says it's an abomination for those who sow discord among the brethren that cause strife and division. Well, God hates that. You know why? Because where envying and strife is, there's confusion in every evil work. This is how Satan destroys people. You know, if you could liken this to like a snake or something, there's some of you that, uh, you know, there may be some people that don't mind handling snakes. Most of us probably aren't in that category. But even if you like snakes, I guarantee you, if you knew that you had a king cobra in your house somewhere, and you didn't know where it was, but you knew it was there, I guarantee you there's a lot of you that would just draw the line and say, that's it, I'm moving out of this house, I'm not going to live here. You might go a week, two weeks, three weeks without seeing it, it doesn't matter. If you just knew it was there, you aren't going to live in a house with a poisonous snake that could kill you at any moment. And yet you'll live in a house with strife, which the Bible says opens up a door to the devil, which is infinitely more vicious and terrible than any snake, and you'll live with strife, and you might even be the instigator of it, certainly one that will promote it and accommodate it, and you don't think a thing about that. If living with a deadly snake is unacceptable to you, living with strife ought to be unacceptable unto you. I mean, it's something that you just cannot tolerate. And yet it's amazing how many people just, well, it's just normal. That's just the way families are. It's not the way our family is. It shouldn't be the way your family is. Now, I'm not saying that you don't ever have problems, but I'm saying you deal with it and resolve it and you don't let strife go on and you don't accept it as just being normal. Man, the Lord here is making this to where it's totally unacceptable. It would be better for you to have a millstone tied around your neck and thrown into the sea than for you to live in strife and offend one of his little ones. And verse 3 says, Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him, and if he repent... Forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. And look at the disciples' response in verse 5. The apostles said unto the Lord, Increase our faith. You know, they had seen him raise people from the dead. They had seen him open blind eyes and deaf ears and walk on water and do all kinds of miracles, and they never said, Increase our faith. But when he started talking about walking in love and forgiving people and treating people kind, they said, increase our faith. (laughs) Not only does faith work by love, but love works by faith. It takes faith to walk in love. And that's what they were saying. When they saw the standard, the bar, how high he raised it, that we're supposed to be walking in love, they said, God, increase our faith. And he goes on, and basically that was an invalid question. You don't need your faith increased. That's what he goes on and explains. You just need to use what you've got. God has given us the ability to walk in love. And I know that tonight I've been painting a picture about how important love is and I've been basically trying to increase the value that we place on love. And by doing so, it may uh, make some of you uncomfortable and it may condemn you for a period of time. And you may think, oh God, if what you're saying is true, no wonder... I'm not seeing things work because I haven't been walking in love and it may aggravate you for a while. 
But you know what? It's something you're going to have to work through because I'm telling you, we can't just bypass this area. You can't live a life of strife. You can't live in criticism and do the things that is so typical in our society and even in the body of Christ. We can't live that way and expect to see the power of God function. And it has nothing to do with God not, hold, not releasing His power because we aren't worthy. That's not it. God is wanting to flow, but God is love. And God flows through love. And when you aren't walking in love, it's just like you shut off the flow of God through you. You know, one of the greatest lessons that I've ever learned is just based on that simple scripture that I've already talked about tonight. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. God is love. And I've just learned that when I feel love, compassion, and you have to have some discernment here to be able to tell the difference between lust and feelings, emotional feelings, and a true God kind of love, which we could spend a lot of time talking about that. But when I feel a true God kind of compassion flow out of me towards another person, I've just come to realize that that's not human nature. That's not natural. That's God. God is love. And so when I feel love flow out of me for other people, I've come to realize that's God, and it'll always, always, always release some supernatural ability of God. And so I've learned that when I have a compassion, like if I'm praying, and all of a sudden a person just comes to my mind, and and I get to thinking about them, and I just feel compassion for them. That's not coincidental. That's love. God is love. And so when I feel this compassion, I follow it up with calling them and just saying, how are you? How are you getting along? And you don't have to do anything profound. And I couldn't tell you the number of times that I've had somebody say, man, this was God. This was God. I remember a couple who were responsible for getting me in the ministry, and we had been super close. He was my very best friend. He was my mentor when we got started, and some things happened, and he got mad, cussed me out on the phone, wouldn't talk to me, and some other things Happened So for a number of years, we hadn't even contacted each other. But as I was praying, I just felt compassion for them, and I kept feeling it over and over. And so I had to run them down because I couldn't get them at their home number. And I had to start calling relatives. And finally, I called the woman's uh, parents, who I'd met one time many, many years, 20 years before. And I ran them down and called them. And I called, and, and the woman answered the phone, and I said, This is Andy. And she just hung the phone up. And I thought, well, that really went well. And I was just sitting there kind of thinking, God, I know I was feeling your compassion for them. What's going on? Within five minutes, this woman called me back, and I was still sitting at the phone. And I picked it up, and she said, I'm sorry, I hung up. She says, you know, we, uh, her husband had gotten out of the ministry. He was working a secular job. They were having strife. They had lost their home. It had just been foreclosed on and she had had to move in with her parents. And she was sitting at her phone saying, God, if there is a God, why do we always have to be the ones minister? Why can't anybody minister to us? And she says, I know that we aren't at home and I'm at my parents' house, but if it's you, you could have somebody call us. Somebody could at least call on the phone. And she was praying that very thing when I called, and she and it startled her so much she just hung up. <laughs> but she called back, and anyway, God put it together, and, and they were able to get back into the ministry. Our relationship was restored. Some good things happened. But see, I've learned that when you feel compassion flowing out of you, that's God flowing through you. And likewise, when you feel anger flowing out of you, At the very best, that's your carnal, natural self. And at the very worst, it could be the devil. And many of us live with this anger and frustration and bitterness flowing through us. And it's just like electricity. You know, there are laws that govern how electricity works. Electricity doesn't flow through wood the same way that it flows through copper. And you may not like that. You may think, well, it'd be a lot easier to deal with wood. I can work with wood and it's cheaper. And so you just wire your house with wood and plug the electricity into it. You know, that may sound good to you and it might 
save you money and everything, but it's not going to conduct electricity the way that copper does. You just got to learn what works and go with the flow. And it has nothing to do with the electric company. They are not against you and saying, well, I'll teach you. We aren't going to let electricity flow through your wood. (laughs) It's not them turning off the juice. The juice will still be there. It just won't be transmitted when you are using wood instead of copper. And it's the same thing with God. It's not that God looks at you and says, well, you aren't walking in love, and so I'm not going to bless you, and I'm not going to release my power in your life. That's not it. God loves us independent of our performance. God wants to move in your life. But when you are in strife and anger and bitterness and you're unforgiving towards other people and things like this, it just doesn't conduct the power of God. God is love. And for you to have God flow through you, you've got to be operating and flowing in God's kind of love. None of us do it perfectly. I am not preaching that you've got to have everything perfect, but I am saying that you need to at least get started in this area and start walking in love towards God. And what we're going to major on this week is towards other people. And so this may not have been what you wanted to come here. Maybe you wanted to hear something else, but you know what? This may be one of the most beneficial things that you've ever heard about how to walk in love with other people and how to start doing some things. And so tonight, the point I want you to get is just that this isn't optional. You need to take this out of the category of being optional. You need to uh, quit saying, well, God, I wished I could walk in more love and then just kind of leave it with God that He has to supernaturally make something happen. No, the Bible told you to love one another. He wouldn't have told you to do it if you can't do it. If you've been born again, God has deposited His love on the inside of you and you've got the love of God. It's just that you aren't walking out of your spirit. You're walking out of the flesh. You're being more influenced by your emotions and by your mind than you are by your heart because in your heart, if you've been born again, you do have the love of God. You've got the same love where Jesus turned and said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Every one of you have that same love love on the inside. It's not out there somewhere that you've got to pray for it. The Bible says in Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. God has already put that love on the inside of you. It's in there. But one of the major reasons is that most of us, we just haven't really had God's standard of walking in love. We, like I say, been influenced more by the world than we've been by the Word of God Many of us have accepted levels of strife and anger and bitterness and unforgiveness and critical of other people and stuff that we just don't realize the damage that it's doing. So that's the reason I've taken these scriptures tonight, not to terrify you, but to just show us how that things have to change. We have to start putting an emphasis on walking in love towards other people. You can't make other people love you. And I'm going to be talking about that. But you can love other people regardless of what they've done. You can give an unconditional love. Your love for other people is totally independent of what they do. It has nothing to do with them. It has everything to do with you. What's going on on the inside of you? And you know, I've said some things right there that need explaining, and that's what I'm going to be doing the rest of the week. I won't keep you here all night and preach everything to you all at one time, but we're going to be talking about this, and I hope that what this does, it just creates a holy dissatisfaction on the inside of every one of you with living at less than what God wants us to be. You need to arrive at a place, and I believe that if you'll receive the word this week, this is one of the things that's going to happen, is that every one of you will be able to leave this place without any animosity in your heart towards a single person. I don't care what they've done to you where you can love any person regardless of what they've done to you. And again, that doesn't mean that you're naive and you just allow people to walk all over you. There may, you know, if you've got employees, you may have to fire an employee, but you can still love them. I'm not saying that you don't have to deal with some things, but I'm saying that you ought to be able to honestly say that you love every single person You don't hold any bitterness against anybody. You wish them well. You don't want to see a single person uh, hurt or fail. You would love to see them succeed. And I just know that there's people in here tonight that can't say that 
and yet you're believing for all of these great things of God and you just haven't realized that your lack of love and this bitterness or unforgiveness or hurt is hindering the power of God from flowing through you. And so I believe that this is going to make a difference in your life this week. Amen? You know, first of all, I just want to pray for everybody in here. If you've received the word that we've talked about tonight, then I just want to water this seed by prayer and pray that God will open up your heart and help you to receive. Because tonight, I haven't really given you any answers. All I've done is try and amplify what the problem is and create a desire on the inside of you that, praise God, we need to discard the standards of this world and start walking in love towards other people the way that Jesus told us to. And so this may be a little um, disconcerting to you tonight, but it's meant, you know, sometimes God has to terrify you before He edifies you. Amen? Sometimes He has to point out the problem and show you how bad it is before you are even interested in getting the answer. And so let me just pray with you. Father, we thank You for the Word of God. We thank You for these truths, Father. And I pray that through the power of the Holy Spirit that You would show every person here tonight that walking in love is not just for the super saint, for the spiritually mature. That, Father, this is something that every one of us are called to. And, Father, I pray that even though people may have been convicted tonight and realize that there's areas of their life that they aren't walking in love and that they've operated in this bitterness and strife. Father, I pray that instead of condemnation, what it does, it just brings conviction that we want to change, that we want to start being what you've called us to be. Father, we want to be free ourselves. As your word says in Romans 12, that when we feed those who are our enemies and hate us, and when we give them water to drink and food to eat, we heap coals of fire on their head. Father, we want to love our enemies. Father, we want to show your God kind of love. And Father, I know that there's people right here tonight who've been convicted and they're just crying out and saying, God, I can't do it in myself. I've lived this way my entire life. God, we need a miracle. Father, I'm believing that this week as we share the word, we believe that your Holy Spirit is here to change our hearts, to cause us to start walking in love with each other and with you. And we just yield ourselves. We submit ourselves. We stand on that scripture over in James chapter 1. We receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save our souls. Father, we believe that these truths are saving our souls, changing our thinking, our emotions around. And that this week we're going to go to experiencing the love of God. Not only for ourselves, but flowing through us and touching other people. Father, for those who've already been convicted to the point that they're ready to do something tonight, Father, we just choose to forgive people. Right now, we let people go, the bondage that we've held them in, the bitterness that we've held against them. Father, we let it go. We just repent of these things, cast it over on you. Father, we pray for your blessings on them, and we refuse to harbor bitterness anymore. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You know, this is a word of knowledge from the Lord, but the Lord is saying that there are some people here that you had strife on your way to this conference. And you know what? You've got bitterness and there's hurts and there were words said before you even got here. And instead of continuing this fight until you wear them out and you win, I hear the Lord saying you just need to humble yourself. And you need to just ask that person to forgive you of the things that you did wrong. Don't mention what they did wrong. Just ask forgiveness and repent and get that out of the way. Start with a clean slate. It's not that important. Man, that strife and bitterness could hinder you. It could allow Satan in and and every evil work. It could keep you from receiving your healing. It could keep you from receiving the revelation and the knowledge that God wants to impart unto you. Right now, you need to forgive. That's a word from God towards some individuals in here tonight. And tonight, before you go to bed, you need to get that straightened out. Again, just take care of your part. Don't criticize them over what they did. You just humble yourself. 
Father, we receive that word, and I believe that you're setting people free. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And Father, we desire to walk in this love. We desire to be the person that you want us to be. Father, teach us how to love. Teach us how to be like Jesus. Thank you for your great love for us. And Father, we want to turn around and give it to other people. So we receive this and we thank you, Father, and believe that this is going to be a life-changing week for every one of us here. And we receive that in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.